Gukesh D, Gukesh Domarajo, a 17-year-old Indian player, is currently in shared first in the candidates 2024. He has decent chances to win the tournament and become the youngest ever world chess championship challenger and maybe world champion. That's, uh, by the way, one of his goals when he was interviewed seven years ago. I've seen a video of that interview and he said, I want to become uh, the youngest ever world chess champion. And now he's on track to do that. He has really good chances and he is demonstrating extremely impressive play. Today, I'm going to analyze two games where Jan Gukesh defeated Magnus Carlsen, the GOAT of chess. The first one was in 2022 when Gukesh became the youngest ever player to defeat Magnus Carlsen. He was just 16. He broke the record of his compatriot, Pragnananda Ramesh Babu, who also beat Magnus at 16, but a little bit like a couple of months uh, older. Uh, and the second game will be from last year, where again, uh, Gukesh beat Magnus in a very interesting and instructive endgame. So let's dive into both of those games. So the first game was played at Meltwater Champions Chess Tour, Aim Chess Rapid, uh, in 2022. And Gukesh is playing the white pieces, this is rapid chess, so both players have 15 minutes per game. Uh, Gukesh opens up with e4 and Magnus chooses the French defense. By the way, this is my favorite opening for black against 1e4. You can check out my videos on the French. Uh, d4, d5. This is all standard. This is all theory. And uh, black tries to challenge white's center while white tries to strengthen the center. So this is one of the Mm, old lines, but still quite popular nowadays. The main problem for black in such positions is the light squared bishop for black, because all the pawns, almost all the pawns are on light squares. So this bishop is considered the bad French bishop, they call, they call it. Uh, whereas white bishop uh, is pretty good, he can, it can uh, be used to attack. So that's why white has some advantage, but nothing crazy. So here white exchanges the dark squared bishops to leave black just with the, the bad light squared bishop uh, and develops to d3. White doesn't mind exchanging this bishop for the knight because then mm, white will be left with a good knight on d4, for example, against this bad bishop on b7 or d7. But black has a different plan in mind. Black develops the queen. Now, if you castle, that would be tragic because knight d3 would be a discovered check and white loses. So uh, queen f2 is what's played. By the way, this is all theory. Um, one of the theoretical lines. Here, uh, black goes b4, challenging the knight, and then a5. And the idea is to get rid of the bad <laughs> or light squared bishop to trade it for white's uh, bishop and equalize and then start to play for some advantage on this file, uh, this flank castle at another rook, maybe to b8 or c8, and put pressure on white's position. This is a typical French plan. So castles, bishop a6, and Gukesh strikes with f5. A very aggressive move, indicating that he is not afraid of the world champion. Mm, I think in 2022, yes, Magnus Carlsen was still the world champion at that time. He's not afraid of the GOAT. He's not afraid of the greatest speed chess player of all time. He just goes for it. So uh, black takes, but now black has this horrible pawn on d5, isolated and not protected. Those two pawns are doubled and uh, although black's a pawn uh, up, it's not a good pawn. Now knight f4 jumping in, attacking this Pawn, oh, logical, black defense with a backwards knight move. And e6 again, Gukesh is demonstrating that he's very aggressive. By the way, this is his uh, style of play. He plays aggressive uh, chess, dynamic chess. He goes for initiative, he can sacrifice. Many people say, grandmasters that I've spoken to, they say that Gukesh is like a, not the best computer maybe, but a, a decent computer. He plays like a computer on low depth one grandmaster told me. So he calculates extremely fast and extremely deep. That's a result of intense training he has 
he has undergone and still is undergoing. So e6, f6, now uh, this pawn is like a thorn in black's uh, side. Maybe later on it can get taken, but not now, because knight takes, queen takes, There, this will be a losing a queen. And also this knight protects it. So rook c1. The computer says it's a mistake, but I really like this move. It's a creative way to activate this rook via the c uh, file. So c3 will come next, uh, this file will be opened and this rook will put pressure on this knight jointly with this queen so it can get dangerous for black. But Magnus just castles and after c3, queen d6. He finds the best move, attacking this knight and if it moves back uh, it will no longer protect that pawn. So white exchanges the bishops, takes the pawn and uh, Magnus doesn't take immediately, he attacks the queen. Great move. Uh, queen defends the knight and black takes and now the rook gets activated. Also this uh, knight protected by two pawns is quite impressive and black has some advantage. So Magnus managed to trick Gukesh like he does to all top players. He just tricks them in equal positions and now Magnus is practically winning. But it is not over, ladies and gentlemen. Knight d4. Yes, the rook attacks the a2 square, but Gukesh doesn't care. He wants to activate the knight, create some counterplay. That's what you should do when you, when you have a worse position. You should not defend passively. You should initiate counterplay. You should sacrifice if, when you can. If you have already a worse position, this is what you should do. That's, by the way, what my coach, Grandmaster Farouk Hamanatov, always tells me. So, rook takes the pawn, knight b5. Now Magnus is already up two pawns, but this could get unpleasant once the rook infiltrates. Uh, queen c5, rook c7, pressuring down the seventh flank. And now Magnus has to find the move knight g6, which gives him an overwhelming advantage. So uh, probably white trades, for example, black takes. This pawn mass is very important, very impressive. Uh, and uh, this pawn will get taken next. Uh, white has nothing practically. But Magnus rushes it. He doesn't uh, spend enough time in this position. He has 13 minutes, whereas Gukesh has 547. So Magnus has a big time advantage and he wants to press on the clock as well as on the position. And he plays rook e8, which is a losing move. From winning, from absolutely winning, he goes to losing. And you, you can say, uh, yeah, Gukesh just got lucky in this game, but this is, not, this is not the case. Gukesh did not get lucky. Luck in chess is when you press your opponent and you make him or her commit mistakes. And this is exactly what Gukesh did. Initiated some counterplay with his knight jumping to b5, rook jumping to uh, infiltrate into c7. And now he finds the best move, which is not obvious. Magnus missed this. Queen b6. And now black has nothing. Black has nothing, it is absolutely winning for white, plus seven. Magnus here spent like uh, seven minutes on his next move, but he did not find any defense. Um, so the idea is that white's threatening to take the knight. And once black takes back, queen d d8 is a check, and uh, the king has, not, has no squares. So if, just, uh, if black makes a nonsensical move like rook a4, rook takes a e7, if rook takes, queen d8. It's not just winning the rook, it's checkmate, because the only legal move is uh, rook e8 and queen a8 is checkmate. This pawn has come in handy in this variation. Of course, uh, black has uh, some better moves than rook a4, but they all lose. For example, knight g6, which is a logical try, fails to queen b7, and this is a battery on the seventh rank that cannot be stopped. Uh, black has to sacrifice the queen here, but this is like absolutely losing knight c7, and you can resign. Otherwise, uh, rook takes g7 uh, check, and uh, checkmate comes next. So uh, knight g6 would be a logical continuation here, but it doesn't work. Uh, Magnus here thought for some time and seven minutes and uh, went knight g5, but uh, got hit with rook takes. e 7 a brilliant move, double excl exclamation point. Again, um, this would be checkmate, so Magnus does not take, he uh, moves his rook, but this, this is futile. Queen c7, uh, now Gukesh is ready to exchange the queens because he's up a piece and uh, he has a dominant position. 
if black takes, he just will take with a knight, attacking the rook, and once the rook moves to some square, the rook cannot leave the eighth rank, by the way, because that would be a checkmate. So the only move is rook two to a7, pinning this knight, but uh, then rook d7, e7, e8, queen would win the game for white. So after queen c7, Magnus decided to give uh, Gukesh one check. Gukesh retreated with the king and Magnus Carlsen, the greatest chess player of all time, resigned in just 29 moves against Gukesh d. But that was just the first time Gukesh won against Magnus. I think there will be many more times uh, that uh, such event happens. And uh, it already happened the second time in 2023 in Norway Chess Blitz. Let's look at that game. So here, those two gentlemen are playing Blitz because it's a Blitz tournament. Uh, but Magnus Carlsen is considered the best uh, ever Blitz player as well. Even better than Hikaru Nakamura in over the board Blitz, at least judging by the feeder rankings. And Gukesh never... Uh, really demonstrated uh, impressive blitz results because he doesn't really play a lot of blitz. Those young uh, Indian prodigies are trained and probably instructed by their coaches to not indulge too much in too much blitz. Except for Nihal Sarin, he plays a lot of blitz and he's one of the best in the world. But Gukesh, Pragnananda, uh, those guys uh, are not uh, too keen on blitz. But they can destroy the likes of Magnus Carlsen with black. Let's uh, look at this game because the end game in this game was really crazy. And the middle game as well demonstrated, uh, it demonstrated crazy attacking style of Gukesh. So Magnus goes b3, he likes playing those weird openings in blitz. e5, bishop b2, fine cat in the bishop, knight c6 defends the pawn, uh, c4 and here Gukesh strikes in the center with d5, which is a nice move. Um, immediately challenging uh, white's setup. Yes, white can attack the queen with knight c3, but the queen just drops back to e6, and it will be an important piece. It's already activated. No piece of white can uh, attack black's queen, and black's plan is to uh, castle queen side and uh, take the center and be not necessarily better, but not worse, have good, good counterplay. So uh, knight develops, bishop develops, and here Gukesh, as I said, castles and goes f5. The computer doesn't like this move, but I think it's a very logical continuation. The computer says that queen g6 was the best move. Well, it's not obvious. Attacking this pawn, and if white castles some time later, maybe bishop h3 will come, but nothing too crazy. Uh, f5 also is a, is a nice move here. White castles and uh, Gukesh already starts expanding and challenging White's position. He says, you are Magnus Carlsen. Yes, you're the greatest in the world, but I'm uh, the new generation that will replace you and that will destroy uh, the old guard, so to say e4 attacking the knight. It's generally a good rule of thumb to put your pawn on e4 when you are attacking on the king's side. Uh, h4, g4, uh, h3, that would be a plan for, one of the plans for black. Uh, also, if you're playing white, uh, you can put your pawn on e5. It's also a, a, good, a good idea. Or put your knight on e5, put pawns on d4 and f4. That's, that's a good rule of thumb when you're attacking. Okay, here knight g5 attacks the queen. The queen drops back. Also, the computer gives question marks to some of those moves, but they are not horrible blunders. They are just not the best moves according to the computer. And it's blitz, so it's understandable that both sides are playing not perfect chess, but very impressive chess. Here, f4 is a mistake by Carlsen because here uh, h6 is a very good move by black, challenging this knight, and the only retreating square for the knight is h3, which is a sad square for the knight to be. Already, after the opening, 12 moves, 12 moves in, black has a great position with great advantage, minus 1.2 according to the computer, which is a good, almost winning advantage uh, if two computers play each other. So knight develops to f6, uh, Carlson tries to maybe initiate some counterplay 
um, on Black's King because when we have opposite side castlings, uh, black castling long, white castling short. The main, the main thing, the most important thing for both sides is to attack, attack, attack. You can even sacrifice material because you need to get to the enemy skin first. That's uh, that's a good rule of thumb in such positions. So king b8 is a good prophylactical move. Once you castle queen side, you need to spend the tempo uh, running your with your king uh, further from the action. <laughs> a3 prepares b4 and expansion here. Bishop uh, e6 uh, develops this rook. Uh, before queen d7. Here the queen attacks this backwards pawn. So the knight has to retreat. This is an ugly move, but uh, it's a way to defend uh, this pawn. And already you can see by the computer variation, the position is very pleasant for black. Uh, pleasant advantage here. The knight could rotate to d5. Uh, but this bishop now jumps in and pins this uh, c7 pawn, which could get unpleasant. Uh, knight jumps to d5, another bishop activates, and here king a8. It's given a quick question mark by the computer, but it's a good move. Uh, this pin is no longer in action, so c6 is possible, and getting the king tucked away in the corner in such positions is a, a good strategy. So queen b3, putting more pressure, knight c6. You see that uh, chestnut comes, engine doesn't like some of those moves, but well, both sides are under a minute now and they are making good, but not the best moves. Bishop drops back, rook g8 indicates the intention to barrel down the g file, attacking the enemy skin. By the way, this is not the best move. The best move would be, according to the computer, a6, but it's a crazy move to make by a by a human. And now, uh, now on low, on higher depths, queen f7 is also one of the recommendations of the computer. Well, this is more logical, transferring the queen. Uh, but rook j8 is absolutely fine. Queen, um, queen will also join, if necessary, later on. g5. Okay, the attack begins. Knight, uh, knights and uh, bishops are exchanged, and Carlsen is not happy about the attack and he decides to exchange the queens but this does not stop black's attack it's not necessarily game over it's not necessarily a complete uh, stopping of the attack if you exchange the queens sometimes you can attack even without the queens rook c2 defends the spawn but again not the best move because black uh, continues its advancement g4 and now uh, a5 challenging these pawns. Also, this is a pawn chain that should be challenged. According to Aron Nimtsevich, a great chess theoretician, you should always challenge opponents' pawn chains um, and uh, try to destroy them. This is exactly what uh, Gukesh, being a classically trained chess player, does. So now uh, white has this uh, weakness on a3, which also could be uh, attacked. Uh, white defense, bishop activates via this. Uh, diagonal, bishops get traded, and we enter into an approximately equal endgame, but things will get heated very soon. Knight h1 is a clumsy move, but the idea is to rotate the knight to g3, not the worst square, where it will uh, attack this pawn. Uh, rook g7 activates the rook, and now the king moves closer to the center of the board, because in endgames kings should be activated, they should not be tucked in the corner. So uh, Magnus uh, tries maneuvering the rooks and Kukesh maneuvers the knight to a more active square. All logical, both sides are already playing with seconds on the clock, so uh, the moves not necessarily are always good, but still very decent quality of play. And here the king gets even closer to the center. The rooks join together to control the fifth uh, rank and the knight jumps to c5 to jump to d3. This is a weak square for white, and this pawn is called a backwards pawn. It cannot move forward because it will get taken en passant or, or just taken if it moves to d3. So uh, black's position is better, and here Magnus makes a mistake. Apparently this is not the best move because black can just take this pawn. Uh, somehow uh, black forgets about it. Well, it can happen with seconds on the clock, now Magnus remembers that he has this pawn and protects it, but the knight jumps into d3, and it's a great so-called octopus knight on d3, where it controls very many squares. The closer a knight is to the center of the board, 
the better it is positioned and here it's positioned just amazingly it's not even it's not just in the center it's also close to the enemy's uh, pawns and king and it's dominating the position also attacking this b4 rook so uh, rook drops back and b5 using this pin on the on the rook white cannot take because it will uh, be down a rook so uh, a5 is the only move but now b4 and this pawn gets very dangerous very menacing here uh, white starts some counterplay but this pawn will just die very soon uh, rook b5 uh, it's always very good strategy to put your rook behind your pawn in rook end games you should remember this uh, in rook end games and you will be equipped with this knowledge it will help you win games against your opponents so king tries to march to block this pawn but b3 and this pawn past pawns should be pushed is another uh, good rule of thumb and uh, this pawn becomes a very powerful weapon now white's pawn disappears and this endgame is completely winning for black but magnus carlson is the greatest endgame player of all times everybody says it and i'm not here to argue so can he call hold this let's see knight tries maneuvering to this square king moves up knight attacks the rook rook moves down and here, apparently, Gokesh, in time trouble, makes a mistake. C5 loses the advantage, because now white can comfortably take on F5. The winning plan here was to go king A4, and if white takes, king A3. And if white, let's say, takes another pawn, king A2. And the next move will be check, and the rook will get taken, because the king has, will have to move to C3 or D1. And if white moves the rook back, for example, like, I don't know, rook d1, then uh, there is even a mate threat for white, for black. Rook b5, and then rook c5 is mate. So rook drops back to give king at least one square. But now it's, it's over, b1 queen, and mate will follow soon. So this is what was the winning plan for black, but it's understandable that with six seconds on the clock, black makes a blunder and now it's back to equal uh, and magnus feels that he's back in the game and again another mistake by gukesh and he blunders the fact that white can take and if rook takes king takes and uh, this is very sad so c4 is what gukesh plays and now we will enter very soon a very interesting end game it's not over it's not over because the f pawn for white is marching rook supports it this rook defends the f7 square the knight jumps here maybe in future it will get activated to if if this knight leaves then knight c5 is possible rook a7 probably uh, rook a1 can come later but f7 deflecting the black's rooks and now the rooks get traded but white has this fork knight d6 taking this pawn and later taking this pawn already white is playing for a win probably but now black has also a fork of its own knight forking the king and the pawn and yes white has three pawns and black has two but uh, black's king is more active closer to the center of uh, action and these pawns can march very fast so it's very double edged position so king activates d4 white starts advancing its pawns but now this pawn is in danger uh, okay carlson doesn't pay attention to that he advances his pawns black advances his pawns he, um, it's a check now king comes closer h4 again gukesh doesn't spend time on taking this pawn because his plan is here and for example if uh, if gukesh goes e5 g3 wins the game because if white takes h3 h2 h1 queen and nothing can stop this so this is black's plan that's why he didn't take immediately this pawn but he wants to go g3 um, in this position but here magnus goes king e3 now g3 is impossible because king will take the knight so the knight takes finally this pawn this is completely equal but both sides are under five seconds so they are making their moves instantly and magnus carlsen tries advancing his pawns and blunders he blunders he blunders and now gukesh is winning but it's not easy what magnus should have done here was d6 check and now after king e6 knight d2 and the difference between this and what happened in the game 
is that if white goes, for example, h3 here, there is this move knight e4 attacking the pawn, and if g2, there is knight g5, forking, it's a check, a king and a pawn, and uh, this will be a draw. So uh, that what, that's what uh, Magnus could have calculated in classical chess, obviously he would have found it, but it's blitz, it's seconds on the clock, so he went knight d2 instead of d6 check, and this is losing because h3, and now the pawns cannot be stopped. Knight f3, trying to exchange. If black exchanges, then it's a draw. Uh, the king is in time, but black goes knight g4 check and h2, and no one can stop black's pawn. So Magnus decides to go into such endgame. Very interesting endgame. I've never seen such an endgame. King, knight, and two pawns against king and a queen. And I remember watching this game live, and the commentators were wondering if it uh, is uh, winning. The computer says it's winning, but it's not easy, not trivial, especially with seconds on the clock, because the knight just defends one pawn, this king will just come closer and defend both pawns and the knight, and it could be a fortress, or maybe it can be cracked. Let's see what happened in the game. So check, uh, now just uh, some checks to win time, a check uh, uh, to the black king, black king retreats. This is a position that looks uh, kind of safe for white because everything protects, everyone protects each other, but it's not that easy. Uh, so some checks uh, to gain more time because after each move, two seconds are added uh, to opponent's clock. And after some maneuvering, Gukesh finds a good configuration of pieces. Not now. This is just a series of checks. Uh, Gukesh forces white to check uh, because otherwise this pawn would have fallen. And now these pawns will get even more vulnerable. d7, king c7, and these pawns are stopped. They cannot march forward because e7 is controlled by the queen, d8 is controlled by the king, and uh, soon there will be a swank and white will have to give up the pawns. So check, king drops back, and queen e5 check, and now queen d6, a great move. So the knight cannot move because the pawn will get taken, and otherwise the king will march closer to the pawns and it will it, it will force uh, white's knight to, to move and to give up uh, first the e6 pawn and then the d7 pawn. So here Magnus realizes this. For example, he can just stand idly and wait, but then uh, king e7, for example, then uh, one of the possible uh, ways to win this is uh, to put, for example, mm, king... Uh, here and then put it here i think king g5 yes to avoid any forks because king e5 there could be some uh, d8 queen and then a fork on the king and the queen but uh, the king just uh, moves closer to to white's position and this knight will finally have to move and these pawns will fall so because of that, in this position, Magnus tries a final trick, e7 check. If uh, black takes with the king, then knight f5 is a fork and it's a draw. Uh, if uh, black takes with uh, a queen, it's another fork and a draw. But uh, thankfully for Gukesh, he can just take another pawn, king d7, and it's a winning position. And Magnus Carlsen resigned against Gukesh. Another impressive victory. How did you find those games? Do you think Gukesh can win the candidates? Write your opinion in the comments and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.